Welcome. This video is going to talk about the second part of section 2.2 from the Brown SL Chemistry book, where they start talking about wave theory and how this influenced our ideas about electron configurations. So a lot of this will be review um, from stuff we discussed in our previous chemistry class, but a few new points and some clarifications to make. So Bohr's idea about ground states and excited states and his ideas on energy levels for electrons work really well for hydrogen. But when his ideas are applied to bigger, more complex atoms, there are some problems. And it's not that his ideas are all wrong, but mostly they're too simplistic to explain all elements' electron behavior. So scientists like Heisenberg and Schrodinger realize that electrons have to be explained as having both particle and wave behavior. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle simply says that an electron's movement and location can never be predicted because when you try to measure or locate an electron, Whatever equipment you're going to use, you're going to disrupt the electron and send it off in another random direction. So his uncertainty principle says that at best, we can hope for a probable location, but we're never going to know the exact location at any given time. And then Schrodinger's model of the hydrogen atom, he came up with this hugely complicated mathematical formula to predict where electrons would likely be in an atom. And it works with multi-electron atoms. And the solution is an atomic orbital or a, an area on a graph, a three-dimensional graph, an area in the electron cloud where there's a 90% probability of finding an electron. So this is how scientists came up with this idea of orbitals, a spherical S-shaped, a peanut-shaped P orbital, etc. The shape of these orbitals depend on the energy of the electron, and an electron in orbital with greater energy will more likely be further from the nucleus. So this picture here represents neon, and the flash of light in the center is the nucleus, whereas the yellow place is representing the 1s orbital, and you see it surrounded by the bigger pink 2s orbital. And then bigger than the 1s orbital, but confined within that pink 2s orbital, are the 3p orbitals, which are blue lobes, and there's six of them because each one is kind of this peanut shape. So as Heisenberg said, we can't know exactly where any of the electrons are for neon, but this picture gives us an idea where we're likely to find the 10 different electrons. So what are atomic orbitals? Well, again, they're this shape, this three-dimensional shape that's arrived at from using Schrodinger's equation. And in energy level one, there's just one spherical shaped orbital surrounding the nucleus, which can hold up to two electrons, and it's cleverly called the 1s orbital. Based on ionization energies for electrons, or, or energy levels two through six are known to have more than one sublevel and contain different kinds of orbitals. So when we get to energy level two, there's two sublevels or kinds of orbitals. There's still an s sublevel sublevel called the 2s, so it has the same shape as 1s, but extends over a bigger area. So this means electrons in the 2s orbital are going to have more energy than electrons in the 1s orbital, and they're going to be further out from the nucleus. And then remember from the picture, there's also these p sublevels, and there happens to be three p orbitals, all peanut shaped. I think your book likes to call them dumbbell shaped. But they have the same energy as each other, so that's known as degenerate, just means they have the same amount of energy. They also have the same shape, so the only difference is the orientation or where they lie along the axis. So, so there's the px, the py, and the pz. So here's a picture. At the left, that's an s orbital, and um, which energy level it, depend, it uh, goes with just depends on how big it is, how far out from the nucleus its edges lie. And then the p orbitals, you see this dumbbell-shaped and IB expects you to be able to identify which one it is, which really isn't a big deal, because if I look at the left one here, I see the z-axis here, the x-axis here, and this is lying along here, so this would be the py. This one I could see is lying, both lobes are lying on the pz, or the z-axis, and this one then would be known as the px. And again, the only difference is just which direction they lie, top to bottom, side to side, front to back. When you go to the third energy level, then you have another sublevel um, called the d orbitals, and there's five d orbitals, which I think of as double peanut shaped. And the fourth le level then adds the final sublevel, the seven f orbitals. You don't have to worry about the shape of the d or the f orbitals 
but you are expected to be able to identify or draw an S or P orbital, like the question below. So an S orbital, just the sphere, you know, just a circle. You don't have to make it three-dimensional. And then, <coughs> excuse me, the P orbital, if they tell you it's a PX, you just have to make sure you show it's lined right along the X axis like the picture here shows. Pauli and Hun then came in to um, explain how it will, um, these orbitals fill up and why there's only two electrons in the orbitals maximum. And it's all based on this idea that electrons repel or repulse each other when they're physically close together. So they're going to stay as far apart as possible. But electrons are also known to be constantly spinning as well as moving around randomly. And the spinning also causes repulsion. So there are only two directions that spin can occur. You can think of it as forward and backwards or top spin and back spin or clockwise and counterclockwise. And Pauli's exclusion principle says two electrons can occupy the same orbital only if they have opposite spins. And then Hund's rule says if there's more than one orbital of a sublevel available, and remember, if there's more than one orbital, they're the same energy and the same shape, he said then electrons will occupy each orbital with parallel spins before any pair of electrons will occupy another orbital. So it's sometimes thought of as the bus rule. It's just think of it as seats on a bus. Nobody's going to double up in a seat on a bus till every seat has one person in it. So all the orbitals will have one electron before any pair of electrons will occupy an orbital. orbital. And that's because this creates minimum repulsion and requires the least energy. And in the Uffal principle, this based on the German word for buildup, this just describes how the electrons will occupy the lowest energy orbital first and then allows us to predict how the energy levels or orbitals will get filled up. But there are a couple surprises, especially when we get to the transition metals and the D and F um, orbitals. But there's two ways to represent an atom's ground state configuration. We can use the arrows and boxes, which are called orbital diagrams, or we can use the coefficients, letters, and superscripts in an electron configuration. So you see an example of each one below here for the first five elements. And on the left, that's one way of representing the Uffbau diagram. And um, if you remember from last year, you really don't need the Uffbau diagram because your periodic table is sorted according to blocks and you should be able to write the configuration just looking at the periodic table. So relative energy of the atomic orbitals. Relative energy is just compared to each other. Each other. So the energy of a 3p orbital for any one kind of atom, so let's say aluminum, any electron in the 3p orbital will have the same energy. But if we go to a bigger element like calcium, those 3p elements or those 3p orbitals in calcium might have a different energy than they do in aluminum. So the energy of an orbital depends on the traction between the nucleus and the electrons plus the inner electron repulsion between the electrons. So these interactions are going to change with the charge on the nucleus and the total number of electrons. So in other words, both are going to increase. The charge on the nucleus will increase as the atomic number increases and so will the total number of electrons as the atomic number increases. And where it gets a little weird, the relative energy between orbitals is when we get to transition metals and fill in the d orbitals. The 4s orbital will fill before the 3d orbital begins filling as we go across period 4. But when the transition metals lose electrons, they lose the 4s electrons before they lose what we thought were the higher energy 3d electrons. So that means once the d orbitals start filling, they push the 4s orbital and electrons out to a higher energy, which is why they are lost first. So they fill first and they lose first. Usually it's just the opposite. Whatever's filled last is lost first, but that's where an exception is. So that means IB and most scientists actually write configurations with the d orbitals listed with their energy level. So 3s, 3p, 3d, then 4s. So we write them in the way the electrons are going to be pulled off, not in the order that they fill up. So here's an example. It says the atomic number of vanadium gives the number of electrons, 23. So electron configuration is going to be 1s2, 2s2, etc. And you notice initially here they write it just like we did last year, 4s2, 3d3. But we actually, it's uh, more acceptable 
to write it this way with the 3D3 and then the 4S2. Since the 3D sublevel is going to fall below the energy of the 4S once the 4S is occupied. And then as far as unpaired electrons, since only two can fit into there, there's no unpaired electrons here. But the 3D orbitals will each have an unpaired electron for a total of three. And unpaired electrons is something that's going to be important as we continue this year. Noble gas configurations, you might remember then, um, represent just the outer electrons or valence electrons, since valence electrons are mostly responsible for chemical behavior. So we don't usually need the full configuration. We can just represent the inner electrons by the noble gas whose configuration they mimic. So you put it in brackets along with the name of the noble gas. And then the outer electrons are shown with the usual coefficient letter and superscript. Okay, electron configurations for chromium and copper. Since period 4 is the first period where the d orbitals are being filled, and therefore fill the 4s electrons first, then push them out to a higher energy level as the 3d fills up. It's also the first period where we see some unique features of the transition elements, specifically chromium and copper. They each have a unique configuration, and you can see it below. It's diagrammed, and I've written the configuration. In both cases, they only have one electron in the 4s, and that's because with the chromium, it leaves five electrons in the 3d orbital, or leaves it half-filled, and the 4s half-filled, so having all six of these orbitals half filled takes a lot less energy than if we gone ahead and put a second one, I guess I should use black here, than if we put a second electron here and left one of these empty. That would take way more energy. And then similarly, if we go ahead and fill up the 3D here and leave the 4S half empty, that takes far less energy than if we filled the 4S and left one of these half full. So it's all about what requires the least amount of energy, and this is what scientists have discovered happens with chromium and copper. So half-filled orbitals are much more stable than two-thirds full or one-third full. So we see some unusual behaviors, especially with the d orbitals, if we can get them half-filled or completely filled. And then real quickly, just electron configurations for ions. Remember, positive ions are formed by the loss of electrons from outer sublevels. So this is going to be the highest energy electrons will be lost first. So aluminum with its configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, uh, 3s3 will typically lose all three electrons from its s orbital to become stable. But we can look at the configurations as one electron at a time is uh, pulled off. If you just had Al+, its new configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. And Al2 plus would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And then the most stable Al3 plus would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Transition metals, remember, will lose the 4s electrons before the 3d. So if we go back to the idea of chromium, chromium is going to lose the one electron from the 4s and then two more from the 3d to become stable at chromium 3 plus. And it would have the... Um, configuration of argon 3d3 and again that's why it's helpful if we've written chromium as argon 3d5 4s1 we can see this electron will be lost first and then two of these electrons will be lost leaving us with the 3d3 negative ions simply add electrons into the next available orbital and usually that results in filling up that orbital And then this last slide just reminds you that the periodic table has its odd shape because it's divided into the four blocks, S, P, D, and F blocks. So elements in the S block have valence electrons in the S orbital. The six uh, families that are in the P block have valence electrons in the P orbital. Although, remember, hydrogen and helium in this case are placed in uh, families one and two here. But neither one really belongs in family one and two. And in fact, often you see hydrogen over here with the noble gases because it's stable with just two. And hydrogen doesn't behave anything like the other metals of family one, although it can behave like metals do in single replacement reactions. So hydrogen and helium are a little unique to their families and where they're placed on the periodic table. And then finally, DNF block elements have outer electrons in the DNF orbitals.